بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا وبعد uh, My dear brothers and sisters, we have the announcement today or the lecture was entitled The Three Steps to Success However, there's been a bit of change of plans and that's due to uh, reflecting on something as I was reflecting with uh, some of the brothers the other day uh, about a very important topic and that is to have the Quranic principles and the principles that the Quran teaches us that we have these principles as part of our life what do we mean by certain principles certain ayat it could be a few words two three words in, in an ayah part of an ayah the middle of the ayah the end the beginning but there's a certain qaida or principle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to teach us in these few words as a principle that we live by as a principle that we understand things by and there's many examples all throughout the Quran. Uh, some months back, we gave a khutbah here in Fanar about the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah that perhaps you dislike something, but it's actually better for you. This is a principle. This needs to be part of, of your life. When something goes wrong, something happens, something that you dislike, automatically, immediately, you say that perhaps you dislike something, but it's actually good for you. This becomes a principle. It becomes how you understand. When the Prophet وسلم, was in the cave with Abu Bakr radiallahu an, what was the principle that he used? Inna Allah ma'ana. Allah ordered us to go out and make hijrah. Then indeed Allah is with us. Allah is going to be with us. He's the one who ordered us to go out. He's going to assist us. He's going to be there for us. As long as we're striving for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah is going to help us. So these certain ayat, they become principles. How you deal with, how you deal with your spouse, how the husband deals with the wife, how the wife deals with the husband. Look at the beauty of the Quran and these principles that it teaches us. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hunna libasun lakum, muantum libasun lahun. That you are like a garment for them and they're like a garment for you. This becomes a principle of, of how your relationship, how close your relationship is with one another. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he says, Wa bil ma'roof, that you deal with them in that which is ma'roof. That which is good and kindness, you treat them in a kind way. This becomes a principle in how you deal with your wife. Even at the time of talaq, at the time of divorce, how are we supposed to deal with one another? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, فَإِمْسَاكُمْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ أَوْ تَسْرِيحُمْ بِإِحْسَانِ That you're going to hold them with that which is good, keep them with you, under you as your wife, or you're going to let them go with that which is good. And even if you differ, even if things become very sour, and that's usually what happens, at the time of divorce, is it not? There's not really like a romantic divorce, you know, where everything's going well, and you just say, you know what, it's been a, it's been a nice ride, let, 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 let's, let's call it, let's, let, let's say, it, that's it. It doesn't work like that. Obviously, things have gone bad. Uh, the relationship is not doing well. But what did Allah tell us? Even this is a situation. It's gone sour, it's, it's a rough situation. You're not feeling good, she's not feeling good. Allah said, وَلَا تَنْسُوا الْفَضْلَ بَيْنَكُمْ Don't forget the good times that you have between yourselves. All of the good that you have, because there's been no marriage that's usually been all evil. That's very, very rare. You'll find there's been a lot of good. There were some misunderstandings, some things that happened, and they end up differing towards the end. But even if you differ, don't forget that fadl, those good times and the good that you have between yourselves. And I recall recently when I was doing some, some counseling that uh, a brother and his wife they had gotten to a rather big fight. And this, the words that the sister used towards him, they were unacceptable. She was cursing at him, saying some things. And it wasn't her nature, but she was very upset. So what did the brother say? He said, I won't reply to you in the same way you that you said to me. Because Allah said, Because they were like, they both thought it was the end, actually, because the fight got, you know, they thought probably this was going to be the end. So he said, you know what? He said, I'm not going to reply to you in the same tone or in the same way or the same words that you're using with me. I'm going to remember what Allah said. Don't forget the good that you have between you. And he said, I, I, I'm going to remember you as the good, the good times, as the, as the good wife that you were and all the good you did for me and all the good you did for my children. And may Allah grant us both better. What happened when he took this stance by implementing this principle? His wife immediately what? came back when she saw the treatment wasn't the same and she remembered that she remembered the good times as Allah commanded to, to do in this ayah and you get you see many examples throughout the Quran when it comes to dealing with this when it comes to 
an oath, if you made an oath, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, He told us to make the, the hiv to protect our, uh, our, our aiman, our, our oaths when we make them. And to protect or close guard your oaths when you make them. That becomes a principle in your life. I recall when I retired any, from education and I was going in to free myself for da'wah. And I said that, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a big, big change when you're going from stability and having that monthly paycheck as a teacher and everything set up to go to something that's unknown, to go into something that's new. And as I was doing this, the offer that I had received to be an imam of a masjid, going back to the land of my forefathers in Ireland, the offer was then pulled away. Some people in the committee, they changed their mind. They said, we don't want to have the imam now. We'll get back to you in a couple of months. I'd already resigned from my position. I'm going to, on my way, moving to Ireland. And here now I have no job. I left my job, now I have no job. What's going to happen? What's going to keep me firm? Wallahi, ya khwan, just one ayah from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what I thought about. And it's what I used to read night and day. Even I said, that's what, you know, probably kept me sane during this time. I would constantly read this ayah. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, that say that nothing will be written down for us except nothing will happen to us except for what Allah has already ordained for us. That what Allah has mentioned in His decree, what He's written down for us, that's what's going to happen to us. If it's going to be good, if we're going to be tested, it's inshallah in the qadr. Nothing's going to happen to us except for what Allah has already decreed for us. Huwa Mawlana, Allah is our assistant. He's our helper, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa ala Allahi faliyatawakkal al mu'minun. And upon Allah, the believers rely. The true believers, they put their tawakkal and their reliance in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This ayah, alhamdulillah, is what helped me stay firm during this, this difficult time. I was counseling with a brother and sister as well. And the sister, she's a very good sister but she's very rough in her approach and how she advises her husband. So when I sat down with them and she said, I have this problem, this, this, this with my husband. And I, said, I looked at the husband, he said, I agree with her 100%. I said, okay, why don't you change and do what she wants you to do? He said, it's the way she says it. He said, it's not, it's not what she says, it's how she says it. And he said, this is what always gets me about her. He said, it's how she says it. So she started to work on changing the things, on how she says things. And what happened in the end? The husband ended up changing and they both became very happy again, alhamdulillah. Because it wasn't what she was saying, it was how she was saying it. And this is what I want to talk about tonight, one of the principles in a bit of depth. And that is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَقُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ husna, And to speak good to the people, say good to the people. This is the way of the believer. This becomes a principle. And it doesn't matter who you're dealing with. As a Muslim, when you deal with people, if you're dealing with your spouse, if you're dealing even with your children, you speak good to them. When you're dealing with, if you're someone in authority, dealing with those who are under you, you treat them with respect and you say good to them. This is the way of the believer. And as we know from the teachings of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلْيَقُولْ خَيْرًا أَوْ لِيَسْمُتْ Whoever believes in Allah on the last day, then let him say good or let him remain quiet. If you have nothing good to say, don't say anything at all. This is the teachings of Islam. وَقُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ husna, And say good to the people. And say good to the people. If you're going to speak to the people, only speak with that which is good or you remain quiet. And this principle regulates how a Muslim speaks with people and also how he deals with people. Because if you speak with people properly, then also you're going to deal with them in your actions and your manners properly as well, in all aspects. Because you train yourself to only say that which is good, so you're going to automatically find yourself only treating people and your actions with that which is good as well. And Shaykh Ibn Uthaymeen, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said something when it comes to the qawl al-hasan, the good statement that Allah is commanding us to say here. He said, there's two elements that must be met in that statement in order for it to be hasan, for it to be good. First of all, is how you say it, how it comes out. How you say it, you say it in a good way, you say it in a way that is not harsh. You say it in a good way, and you say it in a way that is not harsh. And secondly, the meaning of how you say it, the meaning of what you say, that it's good, 
and it's something that doesn't have a negative meaning in what you say. When you look at the importance of this, all throughout the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and throughout the Sunnah of our beloved Prophet, talking about the importance of having good speech and how you speak to others. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al Isra, and say to my servants that they should say that which is best. And this implementation throughout the Quran and dealing with different people. When it comes to dealing with our parents, what is the Quranic principle of how to deal with them? The general meaning falls under no doubt. Because say good to the people. Obviously the parents have the, the highest level of respect as Muslims. The highest level. Therefore we only speak good and positive when we speak to our parents. But there's something else mentioned in the Quran as well. How do you speak to your parents? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, uf. And don't say to them, uf. Don't say to them, uf. And do not repel them by speaking roughly towards them. And say to them a noble word or a gentle word. Speak positive when you speak to your parents. Don't say to them, oof. And the language that we have today, what is oof? And I always tell the, the kids to pay attention to this. The word oof is what? In modern day, well, it doesn't matter if you speak Urdu or, or Hausa or, or, or English or French, whatever you speak. What is the modern day oof? Or even like the brother said with the face. You show, you, you show that you're not upset with the face when they tell you some, a facial expression. Like this, or tsh, tsh, you hear that, that, that sight of, uh, sound of disrespect. That's the word oof, that's the meaning right there. Because the word oof is the smallest thing that you can say. So don't even say to your parents oof. This becomes a principle to, to us as a Muslim on how I deal and how I speak with my parents. I don't say oof. And I don't repel them, I don't speak roughly towards them when I reply to them. And I say to them, qawlan karima a noble, a good word when I speak to them. This is how I speak to my parents. And then another example, which all of you should be able to answer, inshallah, because it comes from a small surah that most of us memorize. When it comes to how we speak and how we deal with a beggar, if a beggar were to come up to you in the street and ask you to give them some money, how do you deal with them? From Surah Al-Duha, what does Allah say in Surah Al-Duha? وَأَمَّا السَّائِلَ بَآيَةً فَلَا تَنْهَرْ And the سَائِلَ, the one who's the beggar, or the one asking for money, فَلَا تَنْهَرْ That you don't repel them harshly. You don't speak to them harshly. روح مني, get away from me. Go, امشي. It's not respectful. It's not respectful. It's not respectful. <laughs> so this te- the, it's another principle of the Qur'an teaching us on how to deal with beggars. This becomes a principle in our life. The general principle that we know is وَقُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ حُسْنَا and to speak well to the people, to speak good to the people. And when it comes to the beggar, they have this, which is, وَأَمَّا السَّائِلَ فَلَا تَنْهَرْ When it comes to those who are asking to give, even if they're a bit annoying sometimes, huh? that you say, you kindly say, if you don't want to give to them, may Allah give you, may Allah help you, make dua for them, Allah kareem, whatever you say, and you continue on your way. When it comes to dealing with those who are the ignorant people and how they speak to you, because speaking with husna and good to the people it's not just to those who are good to you. You're going to have those who are going to be ignorant in dealing with you. Those who are going to be rude in dealing with you. What's the best way to deal with this type of individual? We know from the Quran and Surah Al-Furqan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about Ibad al-Rahman, the servants of al-Rahman, the ones who walk upon the earth, honan, alladhina yamshuna ala al-ardi, honan. They walk upon the earth easily, peacefully, and if the ignorant ones speak to them, what do they say? And they say, peace be unto you. They come with ignorance to you. They come with harshness to you. They're rude towards you, but you come with a peaceful response to them. And always what happens when someone does this, you're going to find it's going to have an, it has to have an effect on them. How many people have been enemies of people, hated people, but when they saw how they responded to them in a nice fashion, they became from those who support them, those who love them. And you see the scholars of Islam, how they would implement this ayah. Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah ta'ala, 
when people would come to him with saying things of ignorance, he would say the ayah, Salamun alaykum, huh? or Salamun alaykum. He would say to them, then peace be unto you. And he, they would say ignorant things to them, and he would say, peace be unto you. Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, he's walking home one day, and some ignorant person comes up to him and starts to, to curse at him and to slander him and say negative things to him, and he didn't even reply to him. He didn't even turn. He said, until he reached his house, and then he turned to him and he said to him, is there anything else you would like to say? And he said, the whole time I've been saying negative things to you. And you have not and he said, you want to say if there's anything else? And he said, of course. He said, the whole time you've been taken away from my, my sins and my bad deeds and giving me your good deeds. He said, I'm winning the whole time, alhamdulillah. Yeah? So this is the way we look at it. If ignorant people speak to us, we say, Salam, peace be unto you. And always you're going to find when you come back with someone and you speak to them in a positive way, that the person is going to turn, perhaps will bring your enemy. And I'm going to mention a story that happened to us in Ireland. A person who was an enemy of the Muslims, who became one of the biggest supporters. She didn't accept Islam, but she became a supporter of the Muslims after she was one of the biggest enemies towards us and when we were establishing some da'wah projects there. And I'll mention the story at the end, inshallah ta'ala. When it comes to dealing with the people of the book, when it comes to giving da'wah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how are we supposed to invite them and call them and speak to them about Islam and speak to them about their religion? Allah made it very clear in Surah Al-Ankabut. And do not argue with the people of the scripture except for in the way that was best. Once again, and speak good to the people. When you speak good to them, you have to speak to them in the best way. Speak to them in a way that's suitable. So a way that they're going to be able to understand their religion. That's why in the other verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, and this is a principle, ya khwan, you talk about the qawa'ad, the principles of the Qur'an, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَا تُسُبُّ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ فَيَسُبُّ اللَّهَ عَدْوًا بِغَيْرِ عِلْمِ Do not curse those who are, or who are making dua to other than Allah. Who is the worst person on the face of the earth? He's the one who joins partners with Allah, the mushrik. The one... The most gravest sin that you can commit, as the Prophet وسلم, told us, when he asked, What is the greatest sin? He said, niddan wa huwa khalaqak. To make equals to Allah, and Allah is the one who created you. Allah created you, and you make something equal to Him, you call on something other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and He's the one who created you. This is the greatest sin. But yet, Allah, Allah tells us in the Quran, Wala min Do not curse those. Don't slander them, don't say anything negative to them. Negative to them. Because what's going to happen? What's going to be the outcome? Because they're going to come back and they're going to curse Allah out of ignorance. And that's why when somebody comes and says, your religion says this and your religion is that, and you're going to find the whole firmer to their religion. Maybe he wasn't even religious before, but he became religious now because how you dealt with him. And he's not going to look at Islam and the Muslims in a positive light. This principle also reminds us of another principle. And that is that everything that we say as Muslims, we're going to be held accountable for. Allah told us in Surah Qaf, مَا يَلْفِذُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيبٌ عَتِيدٌ مَا يَلْفِذُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيبٌ عَتِيدٌ That he, you, he, you do not utter a single word except you have an observer prepared to write it down. The angels are there recording every single thing you say. And that's why this principle is so important that we train ourselves at all times when we speak to the people, وَقُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ حُسْنًا Only speak good to the people. If you have something to say to the people, how you deal with the people, how you speak to the people, no matter who it is. Because some people you'll find when it comes to how they deal with somebody who is important, he speaks very nice to them. You'll find that when the police officer pulls him over, he speaks very nice to him. He's very polite. But you'll find sometimes in his house how he deals with his families, sometimes how he deals with the workers. I remember some of our scholars, they put the, the rulings of the household and how you speak good to the people. They said, even to the mate. You speak to the mate with respect just like you would speak to your mother and your father. Because at the end of the day, she's older than you. At the end of the day, she's any, whether she's a Muslim or even a non-Muslim, you have to respect them. You have to speak nicely to the people. You have to be kind to the people. And this is the way in all aspects of life. Because if you speak something ill, you speak something wrong, you speak something negative, all of that is being recorded 
in the scale of your bad deeds. When you look at our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Anas radiallahu an, who was the servant of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for 10 years. He served the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for 10 years. His mother brought him to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was about 10 years old when the Prophet arrived in Medina. And he, stood, he, he was there serving the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam until the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said that during this time, I never heard the word oof from the Prophet Sallallahu Do you think this 10-year-old boy, who later became uh, up to his about 20 with the Prophet Sallallahu or late teens, and to the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, do you think that he never made a mistake? You think he never made a mistake in how he dealt with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi or the things that he was told to do? In fact, one time he told in one of the stories, he said, the Prophet ﷺ sent me to do something, and he's a young boy. He said, I went and I saw the kids playing in the street. So I stopped to observe. He stopped to watch them, which is something natural. Who's at home waiting for him to come back with what he was ordered to go do? The Prophet ﷺ. Look how busy he is. Look at his status, who he is, alayhi salatu wasalam. At Anas, he's late. He hasn't come back yet. The Prophet ﷺ went out looking for Anas radiallahu anhu. When he found him, he came and put his hands on him from the back and he turned around. He saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam smiling. He said, yeah, Unis. He said, what did I order you to do? What did I tell you to do? He said, you told me to go do this. He said, then go do it. And, he, and he's smiling, not speaking to him roughly, not speaking to him in, in a bad way. So you need to do your job properly. Huh? A little backhand like some of us might give if it was us or maybe to raise our voice. What are you doing? We ordered you to go do this. And even if someone were to do that and you were ordered to go do your job, you would find that and it, it might be normal for people. But if you want to reach the highest level of being a true Muslim and being like the Prophet wasallam, here, you see the example. What it, in the, it's talked about not saying it to the parents, oof. But here he's saying that even to this young boy, he never heard oof from the Prophet wasallam. The Quran taught us not to say oof to our parents. But here, even to the young boy, Look at the teachings of the Quran, how it was put into what? Into action by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When you look at how the companions and how those who follow in their footsteps later, how they would implement only saying good. And when you, lay, when you train yourself only to say good, what's going to happen at the time where you want to say something negative? You're going to find you're going to be able to control your tongue. What happens, why you can't control your tongue a lot of the times is because you are not training yourself to always speak good. Therefore, when the time comes for you to be able to control, you can't control your tongue. There was a story that Malik ibn Dinar, rahimahullah ta'ala, one time his wife became very angry to him. And she said to him, Ya Munafiq. Here's this, this pious individual who was well known for his piety and and, and, and being a scholar and being a worshiper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here's this, this woman, his wife, telling him, Ya Munafiq. I mean, that, you know, is something bad, or not, not, even, not even Fasiq, you know, Munafiq, you know. This is like Kufr almost, right? He's a Kafir, basically, if he's a Munafiq, right? <laughs> so she's calling him Munafiq. Are these pleasant words from his wife? Are they fighting words? It's, this could make him very angry in return. And who, and who got her to say these words? Shaytan. Shaytan is the one who tricked her into saying these words. She doesn't believe he's a munafiq, but she's upset. That's the worst thing she could, she could have she thought about at the time of anger, so she let it come out. If he came back with something interesting, or something, uh, came back with something more severe, or something on the same level, or even a little bit less, what's going to happen? It's going to get even worse and worse and worse, and the, and the fighting is going to continue, and eventually it might end with what? With divorce. What did he say to her? Not in, in order not to give shaitan the opportunity, he said, no one knows my name except for you. No one knows my, my name except for you. So even her, that, it surprised her and it calms her down at the same time right away. And this is how we, how can we get to that level? Obviously through your iman, through learning to control your tongue. But one of the main ways to control your tongue is when you're always saying that which is good. You're always speaking to people in that which is good. You're always implementing the sunnah and the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by 
not saying anything if you don't have anything positive to say. Look at the hadith. Whoever believes in Allah in the last day. It wasn't just the believer says this or, or say good or be quiet. That's, it's, it's, this hadith is deep. Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawm al-akhir. Whoever believes in Allah in the last day. If you have true iman, فَلْيُقُولْ خَيْرٌ أَوْ And this is an amr, a command from the Prophet ﷺ, say good or remain quiet. This is the option you have. If you truly have true iman, and how do we train ourselves to do this? By constantly training ourselves to say good. If we want to die on the kalima of la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, may Allah help us all to be from those who say the shahada at the time of death, Ya Rabbil Alameen. If we want to be able to say it, we have to train ourselves to always say good. We train ourselves to say evil. We train ourselves to say bad words. When something drops, what do we say? Oh, sugar. All the time, huh? Right away. It's something on the tongues, khalas. We train ourselves. So what happens if you get into a car accident? What do you say? When you're about to go into the car in front of you? Oh, sugar. You're going to say it. That's what's on your tongue all the time. And if you die, you meet Allah on your last deed saying, oh, sugar. But if you train yourself, subhanallah, la ilaha illallah, Allah akbar. See, that, that could be the last words, and that's how you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it's, it's the training of the tongue to always say good to people, to always, say, always have good words on your tongue, and that's when you're going to find the impact. Two stories that I'll mention to you as we're, before we come to an end, and that is two stories that happened in Ireland. One of our brothers, who was a student from Saudi Arabia doing his PhD, he walked, into, uh, he walked into the coffee shop, and there was an old elderly Irish man who was a bit racist. He started to talk about him, you know, about the Arabs and the Muslims who come and take from the system, and they don't work, and they get social welfare, social, social benefits, and they're ruining our country. And he said it very openly to him as he was coming in to buy his coffee. The brother could have turned and said many things to this old man. But what did he do? He decided to be a true Muslim and how he deals with people. With a khatam hul jahiluna, qalu salama. If the ignorant people speak to him, they say peace. This is a principle. I'm Muslim now. This is a principle for me. Huh? You, might have, you might have to do some, if you know martial arts, you might have to do some breathing techniques to kind of <laughs> calm yourself down. Uh, he walked up and he ordered his coffee and he asked the lady, because usually you'll find these old people, they're usually people who come all the time to the same coffee shop, right? So he said, this old uh, elderly man here, what does he usually buy? What's his norm? She said, he always gets a latte. So he said, okay, add to my espresso, add a latte as well, please. So he, he buys the latte for him, and he said, excuse me, sir, can I, can I sit down with you? I bought you a latte. Can I sit down with you for a few minutes, please? And he said, of course, you know, free coffee. <laughs> sit down as long as you want, right? Uh, no, he's not such a bad guy, huh? So obviously here, mashallah, with his actions of... And not being, in a, being peaceful in how you say to the people and what you say to the people and also how you deal with them now. So he sits down with him. And he said, first of all, I'd like to tell you, because he, he was talking about you people from North Africa and all this. He said, first of all, I'm not from North Africa. And he said, and even if, there, if you know someone from North Africa who's not good, not all of them are this way, he said. You need to know this. But he said, personally, I'm from Saudi Arabia. I pay my own rent. He said, I get nothing from the government. In fact, he said, your government overcharges us. An international student pays 9,000 euros a year. They charge us 18,000, which I don't know why, but you should get a discount for all the students they have, but sometimes you don't understand these policies. So he said, here, I'm overpaying for my studies. We pay insurance. You have free medical insurance in Ireland for the people, or almost free. I actually pay for my medical insurance for me and all my family. And we're actually helping the, uh, the economy here. And I'm not getting anything from the government. I'm a student. I'm coming here to study, and then I'm going back home. So here he sat down and explained it and completely changed his mindset of how he looks at Muslims, they talk about Islam, and it was a very productive conversation. But if he had came and replied in a way, which some people might say you didn't do anything wrong because he harmed you in how he spoke to you. It was very negative how he spoke to you. So you put him in his place. He could have, but he decided to be a better Muslim. Another story, when we were opening up a Dawah center in Ireland, we were having some problems from local neighbors who filed complaints against the Muslims. And we thought maybe it was the noise that was made in Ramadan, which it could have been one of the reasons. But we had one of our neighbors, literally you would describe her as shaitani rajim, shaitan in the flesh. She was public enemy number one for us, going to the city council, complaining, and making sure that we didn't have planning permission to use our center uh, except for certain hours in the day. 
So we couldn't use it for Salat al-Fajr. We couldn't use it for Isha, especially in, in, in the summertime, even Maghrib time, we couldn't use it. What happened? One of our brothers who lived next to her used to always be very, very nice to her. When I would see her, I would kind of just be like, you know, <laughs> but for me, I, I didn't like her at all, subhanAllah. But one of our other brothers, he, was, he decided he wanted to be better. So he just, wasn't just being nice to her, he started to, what, to talk to her. He started to get to know her. And she started to open up. She started to talk to him. She said, no, not all of you are the same. She said, I really hate, I hate it before all Muslims, before I got to know you, because of another neighbor that we had before from the Muslims. We differed about a parking place, and he started to what? Scream at me. Started to raise his voice to me. And in the end, he raised his hand to me. And ah, I did like this, like he wanted to hit her. So she's seeing this, seeing this Muslim, even though the guy had a beard and everything like this, supposed to be, mashallah. Anyways, she saw this from the, from the Muslim. Automatically, she painted all Muslims with the same brush. And she took the Muslims to war. But after the other Muslim who sat with her and spoke good to her all the time, when he would see her, he would, you know, how are you doing? He started helping her out with some things as well, because he was a handyman, the brother. He helped her out with some things and got to know her. And alhamdulillah, then she started to support the Muslims. Anytime, she said, if you guys want 24 hours, the center will be open, I'm going to support you for 24 hours. And she went to the city council and talked to them because he spoke to her in a good way. When you speak to an Nasim in a positive way with good words, it has a huge impact. If you're going to speak with negative, you're going to have a negative impact on you and perhaps on all of the Muslims. And it's very important a lot of the times, even when we're here, when we deal with people, with people who come, who are non-Muslims, who come now to Doha or to any, any in the Gulf, they might not have dealt with Muslims in, in their country. So now when they sit with you, they're going to say, this is how Muslims are. I work with the Muslims. I work with the Muslims, and this is how they were with me. This is how they used to speak to me. Or if they, if, if they see true Islam in our manners, they're going to go back to their countries. Some of them accept Islam, alhamdulillah. But if, even if they don't accept Islam, they're going to come back as defenders of Islam. So no, no, I, I live with the Muslims. I know how the Muslims are. I know how they used to treat me. I know how kind they are. And alhamdulillah, this is the case with most Muslims, alhamdulillah. But as they say in the expression, one bad apple spoils the whole batch. Huh? So you might have that one bad apple and you make sure that you're not that bad apple. That's the, that's the key thing. So you don't send that negative message about Islam and the Muslims. And even if you see someone who is negative or says something negative, it's important that we correct the understanding. I recall one time when I was working some years back in, in, in a school in Dubai that we had one of our Muslim brothers, when he wanted to lie, when he wanted to lie, not just to us, to the Muslims, even to the non-Muslims, he would always say, Inshallah. So they kind of figured it out that when he was lying, he would say, Inshallah. But when he would come to tell the truth, he would never say, Inshallah. So he just came kind of know him. He, was, he, he would lie, you know, Inshallah, Inshallah, just to kind of get off, off, get off my back because he was the HR. So he would say, Inshallah, Inshallah. And if he wasn't lying, he would say, he would say yeah, this is how it's going to be. So I remember this uh, Bosnian teacher. She was, she was Christian, Bosnian. I didn't even know they had Christian Bosnian until I met her. Uh, she was an amazing teacher, very good at what she did, very dedicated. Her visa was delayed for a long time. And subhanAllah, uh, she came up and she, because we were going the same time to do our blood test in the, in the same car, she said, today I'm so happy. I know it's, I'm finally going to get my visa. It's going to happen for sure. And I was like, uh, she said, because so-and-so didn't say inshallah. She said, I know he's honest now, because I've learned throughout these months that every time he's trying to lie to me, he says inshallah. So here, someone who's not speaking well to the people, who is making Islam and the Muslims look bad, and now it becomes my duty to explain to her what, is, what is inshallah means. And why we actually say inshallah as Muslims. In Surah Al-Kahf, what does Allah say? I explained to her. I said, that's why we say inshallah. However, unfortunately, I said, this individual, you know, speaking of, it's my Muslim brother, and I speak in a, in a good way, and, but he made a mistake. He shouldn't do this. Perhaps in his customs, perhaps he saw this when he was a young kid, whatever it might be. But we cannot accept this as Muslims, that we always must be truthful. We can't lie. And of course, we're not going to say inshallah when we lie. So if we see something like this, it's important that we uh, correct it, inshallah ta'ala. So this is the reminder I want to remind myself and my brothers and sisters of, of today is to train ourselves, to train ourselves that when we speak with others, no matter who they are, Juan, no matter what level they're from, whether it's your children or those who work under you, but especially when it comes to those, your spouse comes to your parents, make sure that we speak in a proper manner. And that's all of the nas, all of mankind. 
When you speak to them, you speak to them in a good way. When you speak in a good way, it's going to show up in your actions. And when Muslims implement these principles, wallahi, the issue of Islamophobia, the issue of misunderstanding Islam, because you know, the Muslims are, are wonderful in how they speak to people. They're wonderful in how they deal with people. They're wonderful in how honest they are. These are the, these are the principles that the Quran and Sunnah teach us. But we need to make them principles, not just a ma'luma, not just a piece of information that we have. But when I read the Quran like this, I say, this is important. Like the, the, the examples I told you. This ayah is going to help me get through this situation. I was giving uh, some advice for many years to a sister. I know she's one, mashallah, from the good sisters we know who are working hard for the ummah. But she had a problem when it came to uh, the issue of uh, controlling her anger. SubhanAllah. Everyone has their shortcoming, ya no, no one's perfect. And everyone, you'd be surprised. Anyway. What is my shortcoming? What is your shortcoming? Everyone has a, a specific and a weakness. So this was her weakness. All of a sudden, she made a, like a drastic change and she became like a new person. What changed you? What finally, because obviously as, as we talked to her one day, she said, I decided that I need to do one, two, three, and four. So well, that's the same thing I've been telling you all of these years, exact same thing. I said, I'm glad you finally realized it yourself, which is good, alhamdulillah. I said, but what changed you? What, any, what actually happened to you? That made you change. And she said, subhanAllah, she said it was, I was reading Surah Yusuf until I came to the ayah. Well, she reads the Quran once a month. She knows, right? But when she said, I came to the verse, and that's the beauty of the Quran. Maybe you've read it a thousand times, but this time it has an impact on you, subhanAllah. One thousand and one, it changes you. It does something to you different. That, إِنَّهُ مَيَّتَّقِي وَيَصْبِرْ That whoever has the taqwa and has the sabr, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُضِيعْ أَجْرَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ That Allah does not waste the rewards of those who are the doers of good. So this ayah had an impact on me about the issue of the taqwa and the sabr. And these are the main ways to the jannah. She said, I had to have taqwa and sabr. She said, I know I have to implement the sabr. There's something you should know, but just this ayah. So she said, every time I would start to get angry, I remember the story. And she said, I remember the story of Yusuf and how he was then, laid, he was able to what? Have sabr and forgive his brothers. She said, look what they did to them. Look, look, what, look what they did to him by putting him into the well. Look at the difficulty he went through because of this, being the son of a prophet. And then he gets sold as a servant. And how was he sold? Be feminine bucks. A little, a little bit of, of, of dirahim, a little bit of money, something cheap. They didn't even know his value. And then after that, he gets thrown into the prison for how many years? He sent him in the prison, subhanAllah. And then alhamdulillah, made him successful, but yet he was able to forgive. So he said, if, if he was able to forgive, how can we not be able to forgive and we become angry with others when we deal with them? And then whoever has the taqwa and has the sabr, that Allah will not waste the ajr, the reward of those who are the doers of good. So this ayah was what helped her. So this ayat, and we need to read the Quran and reflect on these meaning, on these principles. And make them principles in our life that we always, at any time, when anything happens to us in life, immediately we have an ayah with us. We have an ayah with us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to have a, be, able, be able to have sabr. We're, we're, we're facing difficulty. Everything doesn't seem to be going well. Everything we're trying to do is not working for us. What is our principle? وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ salat. You seek the assistance of Allah with the patience and then through the prayer. Allah will help you. Turn to Allah in the prayer. Call on Allah. Ask Allah's help. Have sabr. Be patient. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open the doors. And this is uh, the beauty of the Quran. Is that we have these principles that shape how we see things, how we understand things as Muslims. May Allah help us to be from those who reflect on the Quran and put it into action. And Allah knows best. Allahu alam wa sallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabi Muhammad. <clears throat> the brother is asking a very important question, which is, when will there be some times that are harsh? And he, or maybe say stern in how you deal with people. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there's stances where he was stern, alayhi salatu wa sallam. You know, uh, if you look into the sunnah, Aisha radiallahu anha, she taught us when it was. See, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never became angry unless something that was haram was done. Then it's different. Something that's haram is done, I'm not going to, mashallah, brother, brother, oh, And I know, now it's different. No. And I, we have red lines as Muslims. The, right, this is the haram, the haram line. We don't cross that line. So if that line is crossed, then we become stern. No, this is something we, we can't accept. And whether we deal with people who are Muslims, we deal with non-Muslims, we say, look, look, this is, and we say, khat ahmad. This is the red line that we don't cross when it comes to making jokes about the religion, when it comes to doing things that are haram, 
anything else, we're cool and, and make it clear to the people. So this is, this is how you create the balance, like this. When something that's haram is done, something that's not acceptable, and, he, and even when it comes to being a parent, when it comes to being a, uh, uh, a leader, a manager at work, whatever you're doing, there's certain times we have to be, you have to be stern. You have to be serious. And, and at, at the end, what's going to happen is that, it, but you, you don't have to be rude when you say it at the same time. But there's a difference between being stern, being someone who's serious, and someone who's being rude in the, in the, in the wording that you use. You can use very, a very nice word. I saw, I, saw, I saw a brother fire someone today. It was very nice, man. I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, just great manners, you know. He said, um, yeah, and uh, let so-and-so know that uh, she's fired. He said, because, um, he said, I, I gave her two months to do her job properly. When she made a mistake, she said, I, I said, look, I'm not going to be picky, but this is wrong how you're doing it. I gave her another chance. She made the mistake again. I gave her a second chance. Uh, and then she made the mistake. Now it's the third time she's making a mistake. She's not serious about her job. He said, at the end of the day, I'm running a business. You know, he was very, very calm, very nice. Alhamdulillah. Didn't say this, you know, she doesn't know what she's doing. This idiot, this ahmaq, this ignorant person. And he, you could say a lot of negative things because she's not doing her job. It's, it's, and, and it's not like a job that's like, you know, high-tech rocket science, I'll tell you that. It was a very easy job what she was doing. She just had to do it right, but she didn't do it right. And I noticed, I saw it myself, it wasn't done right. So I, mean, she, he, and he gave, I guess he, I gave her two months and I corrected her how many times during this time. So he's got to go. Here, even here, he had to be stern because he's someone who has a business and you represent something that has to be done in a correct fashion. Here, I can't, you know, I, I can't let that, you know, I have to have balance here. I can't let that slide. I have, I have certain standards that have to be met. If those standards aren't met, I gave an opportunity. Now we have to give someone else a chance to, to step in and, and do the job right. Didn't say anything negative about her. Just made dua for her that Allah will give her the best and give her a better opportunity. And, and she was gone. So that was, in a, so that was being stern. I was being stern and being serious. But and see, he, said, he said in a very nice way. All of the, in every single word he used, I was, I was listening to it. Every word he used was, was positive and nice, subhanAllah. Not one negative word in what he said. Except for obviously she didn't do it properly. But I mean, even that, he didn't like degrade her for that. She made a mistake and he said, I gave her a chance. Bismillah. So that's how we create the balance, inshallah. You have a question, brother? Toxic meaning someone who's drunk, any? And sent the, oh. Yeah, okay, okay, I get you. I thought you were toxic. Oh, I was like intoxicated. Okay. I was like toxic, intoxicated. Okay, yeah. Because actually, didn't even deal with intoxicated people, dealing with them many. I remember when I first went back to Ireland, I didn't know how to deal with drunk. I've been living in the Middle East for so long, you know. I hadn't seen someone drunk in like, you know, all of these years. I didn't know how to deal with people when, who, were, who were intoxicated. I didn't know how to deal with them. So we were coming back from Salatul Fajr one day, and um, these, it, was like a, it was a dark, you know, like little road that we were coming. I was coming with my friend around the corner. These three guys, they stuff, hey, who are you? What are you doing? You know? And they were like, really? Like, so for me, I'm just like, let's do this, you know. I just, well, I'm, not even, I'm not even talking. I'm just going to start swinging, you know. That's, that's, that's in my mindset. The, the brother who was with me, he had been living there for eight years now. He got used to the customs. He said, it's a beautiful day, you know. <laughs> and they were like, oh, oh, oh. They started laughing. They said, he said, tell him something jolly. That's all they want to hear, you know. It's like this. I was, I was going to knock him out. Man. I was like, Go to the next one. <laughs> put, my, put my martial arts at the, at the action. I didn't, I, I didn't know how to deal with them. So obviously even those type of people, look, he said something nice to them. Here's someone drunk coming back from a long Friday night. It's early Saturday morning. We're coming for Fajr. He said a good word to him. It's a beautiful day. And they, yeah, Alhamdulillah, it solved the problem. Even this situation, Alhamdulillah. So when it comes to people who are toxic, obviously you advise, but staying away from them. Because what's, gonna, what's important, and this is very important, is that we as Muslims understand this. When you're dealing with someone who, who is toxic, has, who is someone who is negative all the time, and you think you're going to fix them, it could be the opposite. Maybe they're going to rub off on you. You're going to start becoming negative. You're going to become toxic. And that's going to spread maybe to your family, to others as well. So being around these people who are toxic, who are, who are negative, keep them away from you. You advise them. You might have some dealings with them, but then you keep your distance. This is the best way. The Prophet ﷺ, when someone who was very evil came to him, the Prophet ﷺ, he met him in a very nice way. Smiled at him and you know, welcomed him. And Aisha, radiallahu anha, knowing what the Prophet had said about him before and knowing who he was, she was, she, was, she was shocked about how he met him. She said, this is the one who we know, he's this and this. So he said, uh, he said to him, he said to her, alayhi salatu wasalam, Ya Aisha, inna sharran nasi inda Allahi manzilatan yawm al-qiyama man taraku nas ibtigha fuhshi. That the one who has the most evil status with Allah on the day of judgment 
or the ones that the people left because of his 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 his, his, um, his, his, his negativity, and he, or his um, uh, the, the, the negative things or impure things that he would say and do. So these type of these type of people that you need to uh, the immoral things in that that he that they would do that we stay away from them. So this this is this is the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi So this type of person, and many, many people say, "I have sabr, sabr, sabr." Yeah, sabr has has a level as well because eventually it's going to affect you. It's going to affect you as well, and that's very important. Even that you know, and I remember some of the cases I dealt with, uh, and and helping some spouses, that they, they were they were honest with one another. They said that one of them was very negative all the time, and the person said, "Look, I love you, but this negativity is very bad for me. It's having a negative effect on me. So you have to help me as well. We have to work this out." Alhamdulillah, and they did. But that's important that. And if it's someone that close to you, you might have to be open with them. Say, look, you have to make a choice, but I can't, I can't deal with it. And, and don't let it affect you in a negative way, inshallah ta'ala. You, these people, you burn them. You burn them with the Qur'an. The people use the magic. Huh? You burn with them with, with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You, you take them to war. And it's very important, those people who deal with magic and deal with jinns and want to harm people, that alhamdulillah, we as Muslims, we have something stronger than what they have. We have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first of all, and then we have the word, the word of Allah, the Qur'an. Burn them with the Qur'an. And they'll find that they'll, they'll struggle with it. They'll struggle with it. Say, but I'm, we're not going to let it, let it slow. Come at them with the Qur'an. Come at them with the dua. The weapon of the believer. Come to them with, with the dua. Make dua, even these people, upon them. Make dua upon them. That are, and these are the, from the evilest of people, those who work in black magic and try to harm, pe harm people. And these people are not even Muslims, those who deal with these type of things. So these are the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the enemies of Islam. And these people, they need a, a very harsh way. And that's why the Prophet even ordered, obviously, in a, in a, that they be executed, these people who, who, who work in the magic. Not for you to do, huh? but it's for, the, for the judge. Huh? Be careful. Huh? Don't take it after the fatwa. Huh? This is obviously something from what? From the sunnah. That's because of, of the evil that they spread upon earth. So if you know someone like this, it's not gonna, here you're not going to say, oh, okay, say good to these people. Would be good. These people, they need to hear, hear something harsh, and they need to be dealt with in a harsh way by turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to go against them and their evil, inshallah. Um, obviously, when it comes to being patient, brothers asking me to be patient at home with the kids and the wife, generally speaking, you have to train yourself to have sabr in all aspects of life inside and outside of the house. And if you're patient in all aspects of life, you're going to start being patient with the children as well. And so you're going to find that any, one of the ways that I helped help deal, some, someone deal with this before, that were very, when it came to dealing with, with the children, and they're always getting upset, and it's going to harm you more if you don't have sabr. Because when you get into that rage and you become angry, it has a negative effect on you. It has a, an emotional effect on you. And later it's going to have even a mental effect on you as well. So you're the one who's harming yourself. But when you stay in a peaceful state at all times, and this is, you know, the, the Muslim strives to be in that, that peaceful state of being with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of remembering Allah, and always want to be peaceful, speaking in a peaceful tone, speaking in a, not becoming angry. At the end of the day, I mean, these are the, the closest people to you. When it comes to your children, when it comes to your wife, that you deal with them slowly, calmly. That doesn't mean, once again, that you don't have a balance where if a mistake is made, Say, we have to suffer with the killer. You did something wrong, you did something wrong. Put them in their place. And sometimes you might have to be stern as well. And that's even, even sometimes being harsh. And that's why even some of the rulings in the Sharia, sometimes they might be harsh. But what is that is to, to keep things at, at, at the balance where they need to be. So you might have to be stern sometimes. You might have to you know, stand your ground. But once again, you can do it in a nice way. Just like the Prophet did, de dealt with Anas. When he messed up and he didn't go and de do what he's supposed to do, he didn't let it slide. He went and told him. But go do it. And then if you sit down with them and you, and you speak to their kids. And, and, teach them, and one of the most important things that we need to learn when it comes to dealing with our children, we want them to do things that are correct, is to explain to them. Parents don't explain to their children. Haram, it's haram. Why? It's haram. And he doesn't know why it's haram. But if he understands why it's haram, even from a young age, understands this and he's going to, if he understands why he should do it, why he should speak re respectful to the parents, why he should be honest, not from, for me or for you, but for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is more important. When he spills the water, he says, it wasn't me. So I don't know, but Allah knows. Teach them the importance of being honest. Because Allah knows what you do. Watch what you say because Allah knows what you say. Be honest. Huh? When you speak, if they, if they come and speak to respect for them, right away. We train them from a young age. What did Allah say? Wala tuqul lahuma uf. 
Don't say off to your parents. Don't repel them. Say a nice, noble word to them. Teach them from a young age. This is how you need to speak to your parents. So this type of thing, when it comes to having sabr, I used to, and, uh, life is sabr. And a lot of times you'll find people who are good Muslims when it comes outside of the house, they're sabr. You'll find they're having pra- their practice, that's part of sabr. He gets up and he prays fajr in the jama'ah, that's sabr. He stays away from watching, listening to that which is haram, that's a form of sabr. When it comes to dealing with his wife and his children, he doesn't have sabr. So I'm saying it's, it's, it's a complete way of life. It has to become a complete way of life. And that's inshallah ta'ala, the, 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 the easiest way. Once it becomes a part of who you are, part of your DNA, of being someone who has sabr, someone who has patience, and reminding yourself of the, the virtues of patience. And one sister, she said that I started to do the, the, the uh, get some ayat, even though some of the scholars talked about that, about hanging ayat in the house and stuff like that. But nonetheless, it was a benefit in this situation where she had printed out ayat on the printer and she would put them around the house. Ayat about sabr. And she said, this helped me and my husband to be able to have sabr and how we deal with one another and how we deal with um, and how we deal with uh, the, the, our children as well. Something amazing, let me, let me just mention to you, talking about how that, um, Abu Darda, radiallahu an, he said, when he married his wife, he said something in the beginning. He said, if you find me angry, do whatever you can to please me. And he said, and if I find you angry, I'm going to do what I can to please you, or else we're going to separate. It's going to come to an end. This is from the, from the first piece of advice that he gave to his wife, radiallahu anhu. This is what you need to do. And this is going to teach you to have sabr. Huh? And rewind and, and the, the importance of having, especially when it comes with the wife, that you have an agreement. That we don't debate, we don't talk at the time about angry. When we're, and we're angry. If she raised her voice, say, look, remind me, don't just, we're going to have an agreement. Don't raise your voice, I'm not going to raise my voice. Remind me. She comes and you say, look, it's okay, remind me. Tell me what you want, but please don't raise your voice. And then it's going to start becoming what you were. At the end of it, it's, it's a team effort. A house is a team effort. It's, it's, it's a team effort. Husband and wife. We want to be successful as parents, as husband. We have to, be, we have to work as a team. So we, rem, we remind one another. We become better and things like this. And, and then you're going to find, you're, you're going to have the sabr, inshallah ta'ala, uh, once you do that, inshallah. Bidillah. Just a, a quick announcement. One of the brothers are reminding me if we could remind all of the brothers and sisters to put their mobile phones uh, on silent, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakumullah khairan. So it doesn't distract us during the salat. It's important um, that we remind ourselves that we become accustomed when we enter into the masjid, that we always make sure we turn our mobile phones on silent, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, and also we need to make sure that we don't have the ringtones which are musical ringtones because here you're going to fall into several sins when you enter into the masjid you're going to fall into the sin of distracting people in the salat and then you fall into the sin of having the music being played in the masjid so be very careful now you shouldn't have that on your phone at any time but obviously especially in the masjid and even if you have like brothers have the quranic ringtones or whatever it might be also be careful of that if that goes off when you're in the toilet that's an that's an issue so if you have that type of ringtone, even in the masjid, it can be distracting to people as well. So make sure that you put it on silent. Uh, a brother asked me one time, what do we do in the salat? Uh, what do we do in the salat if the phone goes off and we can't turn it off? I said, well, the best thing for that is you buy an iPhone. Because uh, if you have an iPhone, it's an easy alternative. You just go and you put the button down and it's finished. But with the Androids, I said, I don't really know what you do. But even if you had to take the phone out, uh, and to turn it off, that comes back to the maslaha of the salat and the benefit of the salat. And you, or if there's a thing, a button on the side where you can silent it, then you do that when the salat is permissible. And that's important to understand as a fiqh issue that it's, in, that it's permissible for us to move in the salat when there is a benefit in the prayer, something that benefits the prayer. So I recall one time I was praying in Masjid Quba, and one of our brothers, uh, may Allah forgive him, he had one of those big, you know, those big old Nokios with the antennas on the top. He had it on, on, <laughs> on his belt, and that had a very, very loud ringtone. And it, we were like in the second rakah, and someone called him. And they called him back again and again and again for the entire salat. I guess they didn't want to realize that he was doing something he couldn't answer. So whoever was calling, he kept calling back. And the brother was just like, Shh, I ain't moving nowhere, man, you know. 
didn't care. I mean, and it's just like going through the whole masjid, you know, with because you have the echo for the for, in the masjid Quba and just going through the whole masjid. And the guy was just like, a, you know, a statue just didn't move, you know. And I was very tempted to actually grab his phone and to break it. I was, I was like, every, I was just looking at it. It's like, okay, I can lift it like that and just break it. And I dare him to say something to me after the salat. <laughs> I mean, the whole salat has been ruined now because you didn't move. All he had to do was do like this and turn it off. Even if you had to take it out of your pocket and you had to literally like do like this to turn it off, turn it off. I mean, you don't want to go check your WhatsApp while you're doing it, right? But just, just make sure you turn the phone off and then put it back in the pocket. Because this is something we say, Maslahat the Salat. There's a benefit in, for the Salat, for the, for the congregation, even for yourself, so they can concentrate. And I recall one time I was in Sudan, and we had a visitor during Salat al-Dhuhr, a scorpion, decided, mashallah, wanted to come and pray in the front row with us. And I didn't know what to do. I was a new Muslim at the time. And um, I guess many other people on the front row didn't know what to do either. Alhamdulillah, the Imam, he led a, he, he led a bit, uh, it was the first rakah, so he read a bit long in what he was reciting, mashallah. And one of the brothers knew exactly what to do. He put it into reverse. He kept his face to the qibla. He knew that near the door of the masjid, one of our uncles would come in always and he with, his, with his cane, with his stick, his big walking stick. So he walked in the back. He went and got the stick, came back to the front row, killed the scorpion with the stick, put the... Uh, put the stick down on the front row, the imam made the takbir, and he went and he made the takbir, and went into ruku and finished his salat, alhamdulillah. Now, and I imagine if he didn't know what to do, and we're all making sujood like this, and looking out of the corner of our eyes for the scorpion coming for us. So when many people believe they can't move in the salat. Not moving in the salat is something, you know, you're always like this, or the brothers are doing all of these things. This is what's not permissible. And you're looking around for no reason, but if there's a benefit in the salat, even speaking sometimes, if there was, uh, they say, if there was some, someone was about to fall into a hole, they were, let's say they're doing some maintenance in front of the masjid, especially nowadays with people on their phones, right? And now he's looking, he's about to fall in the hole, and you say, hey! So he pays attention, doesn't fall, in, that's, that's permissible here in this, in this situation. So he doesn't fall into a hole, doesn't harm himself. Okay, so this type of thing, or in Tibi, be careful, whatever. This type of thing, uh, it, it's, it, it's permissible to, to make these type of movements. It's important to know in, in the Salat that you can do these things if you need to, inshallah ta'ala. That's... Off topic, inshallah ta'ala, we'll start now with the topic, inshallah ta'ala.